Well, uh, welcome to today's uh, Optical Sciences Colloquium. I'm Russell Chipman, uh, and uh, I have a question before we begin, and that is, uh, who is Jim Breckenridge? Oh, oh. <laughs> um, anyway, oh. Jim Breckenridge um, got his PhD here in 1976, so that means he's probably met every single faculty member that has ever worked here. Yeah, probably. Okay. Um, after he graduated, even Jim Meyer. Yep. <laughs> After he graduated here, he went to Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he started the optics branch around um, 1980. And as a branch chief there, he supported many, many optics projects and graduate students here at the College of Optical Sciences. Um, while he was branch chief, he also found time to teach optical engineering at Caltech, and uh, that's where I met Jim Breckenridge. I was a graduate student in his optical engineering class, and he suggested to me that maybe I would prefer to study optics at the University of Arizona, and he hooked me up with uh, Jim Wyant and Bob Shannon, and I'm, I'm so glad I made the jump. He also suggested maybe I should start work on polarization, polarization yeah. ray tracing, and so he's been a big influence on me and, and many, many um, other graduate students. Um, while he was branch chief at uh, JPL, he served on the Hubble Space Telescope uh, Failure Review Board um, when uh, Hubble was launched. And then he uh, ran the section. It was in his section that, was, uh, that did the JPL part of the repair work on uh, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. So he's been involved in so many um, space optics projects, we couldn't begin to, uh, to list them here. But that's just an example. He was president of SPIE. He's a fellow of the OSA and the Royal Astronomical Society. And in 2003, he won the SPIE uh, George Goddard Award um, for work in space optics. In 2012, he also published a, uh, a textbook, Basic Optics for the Astronomical Sciences. It's a great book, and many of you uh, have a copy or have read it. He uh, teaches here at uh, Optical Sciences, where he's an adjunct professor. Um, and he still teaches at Caltech, and most recently he's been um, working on exoplanet coronagraphs and polarization issues in coronagraphs, um, and he's also uh, writing a book on Aidan Meinel, which we'll hear um, some interesting facts on. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming our colloquium speaker today, Jim Breckenridge. Thank you very much. <laughs> after, that, after that introduction, I should just leave, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk today about who were Aidan and Marjorie Meinel. Building is named after them, um, but they did so much more than that. So the book I'm writing is about the professional lives of Aidan and Marjorie, and it's, um, what I'm doing is research in progress. So far I've done about 45 hours worth of oral interviews uh, with people, and I've done research in the archives at the U of A across the street here, University of Chicago and Caltech. And... Um, doing some research, uh, have done some, as you'll see, some results at the National Archives about Aiden's role in World War II, um, and also at the Navy and, uh, and Air Force. Publication date, I predict, will be around 2019. Uh, if any of you would, would like no, to give me a... Huh? No, 1919. 2019. So I'm off on... See, I gotta add this, I gotta add that. Um, thank you. Uh, I need to fix that. Just send me an email at jbreckin at caltech.edu or an email at my address here. Very much interested in hearing your comments and I'll do I tried to condense it into one chart. Um, during World War II at the age of 20, he was a rocket scientist, optician, and engineer and an uh, ensign in the United States Navy. Actually, by the time he was 22, he was the ensign. And pianist. Um, and they, in 1947, he had his PhD in astronomy from Berkeley. At the age of 30, he was deputy director of Yerkes Observatory. Uh, 33, he was founding director of Kitt Peak National Observatory. 1961, he was director of Stewart Observatory, chair of the astronomy department. In 64, I was the founding director of the Optical Sciences Center. 1982, he came to join me at JPL. 
as the NASA JPL Distinguished Visiting Scientist. And we'll talk about what he did there. After he retired at the age of 73, he did the design and engineering work on the Keck interferometer. This is the optical interferometer that combines the two 10-meter telescopes on, uh, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, his last paper that he wrote uh, is in Applied Optics. It's on the subject of large area diffractive space optics, how you can unroll a membrane into space and create a, an astronomical telescope. This is him, this is he. Uh, on the right there, um, on the left you see John and Gertrude, his, his mother and father, and that's Aiden standing next to them. I figure this must be sometime between 1930 and 1932. On the right, uh, that's Aiden's stepbrother on the far left with the chicken. Here, his parents, actually the lady sitting in the center, I don't know who she is. His parents are on the outside. And uh, that's Aiden in the middle there, probably seven or eight years old, with the airplane that he built. Um, in 1938, when he was 16 to 19, he was in the 11th and 12th grades at Pasadena Junior College. He met Marjorie Pettit in the math club. Uh, his other girlfriend was his concert, in his concert piano class. Piano class. Um, she, he really liked her, uh, but she was admitted to Juilliard and Aiden was not. So they went their different ways and Aiden wound up marrying Marjorie. Uh, at the time, he had a job at the Mount Wilson Optical Shop um, in 38, 39, 40. Getting optical instruments from Germany was very hard, and the American optical industry was uh, not able to provide the Army, the troops in the United States with uh, things like binoculars, uh, telescopes, range finders. So these were being manufactured at the Mount Wilson Observatory Optical Shop. He learned design and fabrication from Roger Haywood, learned a little more about him. And at the time, he made a, uh, uh, a Schmidt, making Schmidt cameras. Uh, he entered Caltech as a sophomore in physics and aerospace engineering. So the Mount Wilson Optics Facility, uh, images shown here during the war. Uh, Roger Haywood discusses the war effort in optics. He invented the schmidt cassegrain uh, telescope. Uh, and a few days after this picture was taken, optics production was started, and then binoculars, gun sights, and optical rangefinders were made. So he was making money here to uh, keep his interest in his hobbies and uh, for his family. And he worked here until the became too difficult. The work at Caltech became too difficult for him to uh, to continue. And that's Roger Hayward. Um, next slide, yes. So 42 uh, to 1944, um, the Navy set up a rocket program at Caltech. The Caltech trustees and Caltech scientists were looking around for how they could contribute. Um, they done this, had a program in rocket research. They had Theodore von Karman, who was a, um, a fluid dynamicist of international renown. And so they turned that all into manufacturing rockets. By 1944, Caltech had an $80 million a year war industry that took over the campus building rockets for the Bureau of Wardens. All told, Caltech on the campus and, and facilities they set up off campus built more than one million rockets during World War II. And the, the whole effort was led by five physicists whom some of you will recognize, Lawrenson, Fowler, Watson, Anderson, and Bowen. And Fowler uh, won the Nobel Prize, of course, for his understanding of of how elements are created in the, uh, in the universe a few years later. <coughs> the technology was transferred from academia to military and industry through students like, uh, like Aiden. Now, by 1944, the rocket factory was running fine. Development was over. Aiden was needed elsewhere. He enlisted in the United States Navy, and that's his picture from his enlistment uh, package. Um, he was enlisted as a seaman third class, uh, he was discharged from that position February 15th, but the month before, he'd been appointed an ensign. So he'd gone from seaman third class to ensign in about three months. Um, he was ordered to crew the Indianapolis as an ordnance officer to deliver special parts for Little Boy. If you know what Little Boy is, uh, that was the atomic bomb that was delivered on Hiroshima. Uh, so he was in training for that. 
when March 1945, Aiden received special orders to go to Europe on a top secret mission. So he uh, left his friends and buddies at the uh, training for the Indianapolis, and if you know what your history is, the Indianapolis was returning from delivering the uh, parts uh, to Hiroshima when it was torpedoed, and only about 20% or 10% of the crew survived, actually survived the sinking of the uh, Indianapolis. So there's a picture of the ship. Uh, this is something interesting I thought I'd bring out. So what you see here are his handwriting and uh, entries in his application uh, for, uh, for officer. And he lists himself as an optician, um, as a physicist, and gives his experience and, uh, and background there. So whenever you fill out a federal document, somebody keeps it. Don't forget that. <laughs> um, I'll pause a little bit. Some of you look like you're re trying to read it. I don't know whether you can see it from there or not. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting document. Uh, moving on, April, he was in Paris. Uh, this is him in his uniform, standing on a rooftop in Paris. Aiden's orders were to become part of a seven-man CAFT team to investigate, document, and capture German rocket hardware and rocket scientists and engineers. Um, by coincidence, he and Gerard Kuiper were staying in the same hotel in Paris, and they struck up a close uh, friendship. Uh, Gerard Kuiper was there as a member of the ALSOS team, ALSOS. Um, just a little side note here, the ALSOS team was um, targeted by the federal government uh, academics to go in and uh, identify which university professors were sympathizers to the Nazi program and which were not, and which ones were of value to, to be brought to the West. Um, Essentially, the United States, in this effort to, to bring Europe's technology out, German technology out, they figured it was four or five years worth of, of technology uh, advantage to the United States to take advantage of these, uh, um, these people. We didn't actually take advantage of them. We offered them some freedom, and they elected. They could have gone to Russia. Um, actually, the scientists had about two weeks uh, to decide whether they wanted to be Russian or U.S., and I guess about a third of them went to Russia, and two-thirds went to the U.S. Um, uh, but now, what was Aiden's mission? What was his real mission? Um, so he was assigned to General Patton's Third Army to gather intelligence on German rockets and optics technology. He joined uh, Patton there in Paris and proceeded with him all the way um, through the front lines as the front lines moved back into Germany. And um, his job was to investigate what was going on in Nordhausen. Nordhausen was where the V-2 rockets were being built by slave labor camps at Dora, D-O-R-A, Wittenberg. And um, he did that. Um, he was assigned to visit the, uh, gee, these are interesting. I didn't know it was divided up this way. Somehow it's partitioned itself. So anyway, he was assigned to investigate and assess the technology. This is a V-1 rocket that went to bombard uh, England. Um, it was airborne launched, as you can see here, on the back of the uh, uh, dive bomber. And um, this was a uh, uh, picture in October 1942 of uh, a V-2 rocket, so it had been developed as early as the 3rd of October 1942. And when I read the uh, history, of this Dornberger, who was a uh, general, said to von Braun, do you realize today the spaceship was born and they're about to launch the man's first, uh, first rocket into, uh, not into orbit. Here we see a picture of the engine for the rocket and on the lower left you see the, the German uh, slave labor uh, working on parts of it. Uh, this is what the bombs did when they got to England. They decimated the entire city, and uh, there was this great deal of urgency uh, to stop it, and which is why General Patton uh, disobeyed his original orders from uh, Roosevelt, which were established at Yalta, and pushed over into Nordhausen, because Nordhausen, the V-2 rocket factory, had been decided at Yalta to belong to Russia and not to the east. So he disobeyed those orders and made a quick 10-day run to 
Nordhausen. And then when the, his superiors asked him what he had done, he said, huh, where am I? I don't know. Uh, so he had, uh, Aiden had uh, almost two weeks in Nordhausen to uh, search out the things. This is the way people lived in London. This is the London subway. Um, so during the bombing, um, they wouldn't get killed. Uh, this is a uh, line of German V2 rockets coming out of the factory, um, all ready to be distributed to launching sites that um, they hadn't been covered. At the close of the Second World War, uh, victory in Europe was May 1945, victory in Japan was August of 45. So over 300 rail cars filled with V2 engines, fuselage, propelled tanks, gyroscopes, associated equipment were brought to the rail yards of Las Cruces, New Mexico, placed on trucks and driven to White Sands proving grounds. Uh, Caltech shut down the factory, uh, needed time to go back to teaching students and doing academics. Um, so they moved their Army rocket program uh, to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Navy rocket research work was moved to China Lake um, at that time. Um, the one interesting technical prize that Aiden discovered at the time was that the German two-stage rocket program to hit the U.S. was under development and there's probably about six months away. Uh, so they were going to put a, uh, a small rock, put the, the V-2 on top of a larger rocket and um, in two stages launch it to bomb the, uh, the east coast of the United States. <coughs> During his um, visit to uh, Europe, to Germany, Aiden visited Carl Zeiss. This is clearly a picture before the war. Uh, but he brought back some special optical filters that enabled Walter Botta to discover two types of Cepheid variable stars. Using this discovery, uh, Botta calculated the size of the universe and uh, essentially doubled it. Um, this is a picture of the destruction of the uh, uh, downtown Germany, downtown Berlin. Uh, somehow, this is interesting. This is messing up my slides. That's all right. <laughs> so here's a picture of Walter Bader. Um so, so even now, as uh, mustered out, he wanted a PhD degree, but he only completed his sophomore year. What to do? Went to the Caltech faculty. Uh, he had said he had only three years of the GI Bill. Caltech said, no, we can't, we can't accommodate you. Um, because of his influence and friendship with Kuiper, uh, Chicago said, yes, yes, come, please come, we'll work with you. Um, at Berkeley, uh, because of his, his future father-in-law's influence, or his father-in-law's influence by this time, uh, they said yes. So he went to UC Berkeley. He entered in May 1946, finished his Bachelor of Arts June 19th of 47, and uh, his PhD astronomy was awarded September the 10th of 1949. And he did this all by reading textbooks and papers and taking exams made specially for him by the faculty. Um, for his dissertation, he built the first uh, Schmidt spectrograph and used it with the newly declassified photographic plates to discover OH emission in the, uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. He was appointed Lick Fellow at UC Berkeley in 1948, and in 49 accepted an appointment at Yerkes Observatory, University of Chicago. Um, this is an old picture of Yerkes, it's of 1919. I put it in here to show Aiden Marjorie Meinel's parents. So she's there on the, on the left, and Edison Pettit. Uh, they both had earned their PhDs in astronomy from the uh, University of Chicago. Uh, in the front, you may recognize uh, Van Riesbrook over there in the dark beard. He spent some time here at the University of Arizona. Um, and then Albert Michelson and E.E. E. Bernard. Some people may recognize those names. Um, this is an interesting, I don't know quite how this got so packaged. Anyway, you have Edison Pettit and Marjorie Meinel, and there's more to this. There's a crater named after Pettit. And um, this is the cover, I guess, of her dissertation. <coughs> These are slides I took from another presentation, but I, I didn't, uh, didn't know they were set up this way. This is Marjorie's parents again uh, at Yerkes Observatory in 1920. 
except now Marjorie's sister is in the picture. Uh, and the uh, 24 years later, Marjorie's and Aidan were married, the 9th of September 1944, in Pasadena. Um, you notice that date? That's before he went to. So he was married when he did all his ex excursions in Europe. And um, they had just a one night honeymoon up on Mount Wilson. And, uh, so th this is an interesting picture. In the front row from the left, we have a number of famous astronomers. This is the Yerkes Observatory, 1951. Lyman Spitzer, Paul Merrill, uh, Shredder Sakar, uh, and then Otto Struva. Uh, Gerard Kuiper has a yellow circle around him. Uh, Nick Mayo has a yellow circle around him. And Aiden is in the back with blue. So there are, th are the three uh, people that contributed significantly to University of Arizona's academic programs. Aiden, Kuiper, and um, uh, Mayo. Mayo through being the director of uh, Kit Kit National Observatory. At Yerkes, Aiden discovered that the source of excitation uh, was providing aurora glow, was protons streaming from the sun. And um, these are the, this is a little spectrum of the N2 emission uh, at 100 electron volts energy level, the spectrum from 915 to 930. This is a, an emission spectrum. Uh, so he was on the University of Chicago faculty. Um, from 1949 to 1955. In 1950, the National Science Foundation was founded by an act of Congress. Um, Aiden had led the writing of a proposal uh, to the National Science Foundation to fund a national observatory, as he called it. Um, uh, and then also, the University of Michigan at the same time had a proposal before the National Science Foundation for a National Solar Astronomy Observatory. NSF merged the two proposals and selected astronomy for its first initiative. So the first big initiative that the National Science Foundation had after its founding was supporting astronomical research. Um, and in about 1952, Aiden was awarded tenure at the University of Chicago. So, these are interesting. I don't know how this is going to work out. I, first time I projected these slides. I should have projected them before. Um, but anyway, picture of Aiden. We're now searching for the new National Observatory. And uh, the site was tightly constrained by practical considerations to be within the US. Uh, the lowest southwest latitude, um, out of phase with the weather affecting California, no higher than 8,000 feet uh, for ease of sleeping. Not expected to be affected by nearby city lights for 50 years. And ease of access for visiting astronomers. Amenities, attractive to staffing. You know, university here is a big draw. And um, these criteria limited the choice to a narrow path. Now, we'll see a map shortly on that. Um, so the role of Robert R. McMath. Robert R. McMath was a solar astronomer. He was a uh, very influential in the um, congressional delegation, both senatorial and house, from Michigan, and a uh, well-connected industrialist. He made his money by buying up the tooling from the major manufacturers and remanufacturing parts for cars. So he somehow had a monopoly on that. Um, he's also... Uh, there's an interesting political, I don't know whether it's time to get to it. I'll get to it later. So somebody asked me a question about it. Um, NSF appointed Aiden Meinel to be secretary of the board. And in 1955, Aiden led a site survey. Uh, Helmut Apt, who told me he was not going to be here. Um, he's 92 or 93 over at uh, uh, Kitt Peak. Uh, he hired the pilot to fly around to find candidate mountaintops for the observatory. Now, the National Observatory philosophy was not a private observatory like Caltech. All astronomers could apply. Telescope time aboard awarded solely on scientific merit. And the observatory was to maintain a professional staff of engineers, office space, data reduction facilities. And staff astronomers were to use the equipment to keep it up to date. And managed by a board of directors representing the universities that had graduate research astronomy programs. 
So it's that bottom line that builds in your conflict of interest. Because each one of those professors on the board thought all that NSF money should come to their institution and not to the operation down the street here. So in retrospect, after uh, 40 years or 50 years, um, it was management setup was a bit flawed. Um, and well, as a result, the United States has been hard up keeping up with the European astronomy <coughs> facilities. So these are the sites that were selected. Uh, <coughs> a site near Kingman, uh, Summit Peak near Williams, a uh, peak <coughs> is out the west of Winslow, and Kitt Peak, which is down right dead center in the Gadsden Purchase, uh, which put it the su most southern uh, latitude. Um, but there were problems. Access to the mountain was blocked. Uh, the Indian name for the mountain was Home of the Clouds. Uh, that didn't sound good. Uh, <laughs> potential embarrassment. The permission was finally granted, and their first ascent to Kit Peak was on horseback. And here's Aiden getting on his horse, uh, going up the mountain. Um, and here we have a picture of Aiden and Marjorie calibrating photometry, photometers for their site survey. He did most of this work in the backyard of their house uh, here in town. Um, in February 1959, now he starts consulting, he's at Kit Peak director, he starts consulting at Perkinelmer in defense optics area. In um, October, he writes a paper, Astronomical Observations from Space Vehicles, rather long, it's 11 pages, and, uh, but he's continuing with his scientific research. He, puts out a paper, spectral classifications for ratio spectra. Aiden recruited a colleague from Yerkes, Gerard Kuiper, to bring his planetary studies group to the U of A, leading to the establishment of the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Um, in March, Aura Board requests that Aiden resigns as director, but he was tenured and retained, remained as an employee of Aura. Uh, and he actually was asked to leave the day before the dedication of the observatory. So if there are questions on that, I can ask you later. You can ask me later. Um, a second paper he wrote in, uh, for the memoirs of the Royal Society of Liège on design considerations for large aperture orbital telescopes came out in 1960. So he was thinking all the time of, of large space telescopes. Um, he, when he set up the Kitt Peak National Observatory, he had a solar division, a stellar division, and a space division. Unfortunately, the National Science Foundation and the NASA got into a big charter war. And, and it turns out that the National Science Foundation cannot do space science research. That has to be paid for by NASA. Um, even the data reduction of the uh, science, uh, space science research. So um, as a result, they, the space division eventually, after about 10 years, atrophied. They did some excellent work in, um, in rockets uh, at uh, Kitt Peak, launching uh, UV, UV spectra, looking at UV spectra. So Aiden moved to the University of Arizona. How'd that happen? Well, Stewart Observatory Director Carpenter planned to retire in 1965, December 1. The University of Arizona President Harville had hired Bart Bach to take over. Now, Bart Bach was a very prestigious, highly well-known Harvard astronomer who had left Harvard to manage in a large observatory in Australia, but his contract there was, was becoming due. Uh, and he was scheduled to take over January 1st, 1966, but Carpenter died February the 11th. Um, President Harville needed a department chair and observatory director quickly. Now Harville and Aiden had been good friends during the buildup of Kitt Peak, because Aiden firmly believed that you couldn't have a national observatory isolated from the academic facility. So they worked out exchange programs and, and ways of, of working with each other. Um, so they had a very good relationship. So Aiden asked his friend Harville if he could have the job. And um, Harville said yes. Aiden moved across the street uh, to Stewart Observatory and began work at Stewart March 1963 as the acting director. Um, and within RAO across the street, the regents of the university wanted a strong astronomy department. 
and Aiden was just the person to give it to them. Uh, but in the meantime, some interesting things happened. Can you read that? Yes, I guess you can. I put this in red. Oops. But I my fingers off. Um, so October 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's a Russian intermediate range ballistic missile close to Florida. The E2 camera system that Aiden had consulted on had recorded images over Cuba. Aiden consulted with both the Air Force and Perkinomer on the design of the cameras for the U2, the A4, and the SR-71. Um, Meinel was on a family vacation in October, miles from the nearest paved road. Well, the Air Force sent a helicopter for him, uh, and the Air Force flew him to Washington, D.C. Aiden consulted on the image and essentially said, no, those are not camera artifacts. And the Air Force then sent him home. <laughs> and uh, he came back from, uh, uh, from back to vacation then after a uh, day in Washington looking at some interesting pictures. And here are some of the pictures, one of the pictures that he looked at that's identified as, uh, as having missile, missile sites. Um, so at Stewart Observatory, director started March 11th. He jumped into teaching classes in spectral classification, instrument design, and started hiring. Aiden was leading now at the same time the Optical Society of America National Optics Initiative with airport support, Air Force support. The U.S. Congress, in orders in 1963, right in the middle of the height of the Cold War, realized that to fight the Cold War effectively, the nation needed more highly trained personnel and set aside funds to build up public universities in the West. All of the uh, uh, academic powerhouse was along the East Coast and, uh, and a little at Berkeley, but those that fed Washington policymakers were all from the East Coast. And um, so the U of A was selected as one of the primary universities that needed to be built up. Now, one of the things I need to investigate is what was the role of Senator Carl Hayden? Uh, in this, because at the time, Carl Hayden was chairman of the Authorization Committee. And uh, he may have had a role in, uh, in setting this up. This was probably his last year. If you don't know who Carl Hayden was, Carl Hayden was a senator from Arizona who had been a, uh, in the territorial legislature before Arizona became a state. And he continued to serve until about 64 or 65, I forget when he, uh, he finally left uh, Congress. Um, so, Harville and Aiden put together a proposal uh, called the Science Development Program Grant with the word of the university by the National Science Foundation. I haven't been able to figure out how much that was. It turns out records this old are kept by the University of Arizona and records this old are kept by the National Science Foundation. But I think it must have been several hundred hundred thousand um, dollars at the time. Um, now here's an interesting, in 1970, Aiden proposed a high angular resolution astronomy with sparse aperture telescope. This is his paper, Applied Optics, volume 9, page 2501. Um, I'm jumping ahead. So he called it the multiple mirror telescope, and Aiden was once again engaged in another site survey. Uh, to find the place to put the multiple mirror telescope, and it wound up down there at the Whipple Observatory. Um, and the six shooter then became real. Uh, he called it that in his paper. You can see it. they're holding models of the telescope, and in the upper left is the telescope itself with its six mirrors. The six mirrors, by the way, came from a classified Air Force program. Um, that um, the mirrors were surplus, and Aiden happened to be at the right time uh, to say to the Air Force, uh, don't break those up, please. We would like the mirrors, uh, if you can get them to us. And um, sure enough, the mirrors appeared at Davis Monthan one day. Um, so back to Aiden. Aiden knew he'd be without a job once Art Bach arrived on January 1st. So what to do? Well, he'd been on this OSA committee, um, and he was encouraged by President Harwell to build a National Center of Excellence in Optical Engineering and Science and put it at the University of Arizona. Um, together they created a plan 
And once again, Aiden would be a founding director. Um, and Aiden used his Air Force and Optical Society of America connections uh, to create the funding. So, um, near as I can tell, the Optical Sciences Center was given permission to award optics degrees in 1964. Um, I've had a heck of a time finding when in 1964. I've been corresponding with uh, the Secretary of the Board of Regents up in Phoenix. And they've been going through their old archives from 1964 and can find no record of any discussion of the Optical Sciences Center. Um, at the University of Arizona. So I need to do a little more research of that. It was, of course, formed out of Stewart Observatory to provide optical science and technology education. That doesn't look like Aiden. Oh, well, that's Aiden. It is? It is, yes. He's got his, e he's got his evil eye on you. <laughs> well, that's Aiden. Um, his hair was out of control all the time. Um, Technical achievements in astronomy, scientific instruments, physics, biology, medicine. Using uh, geomet the tools of geometric, ray trace, scalar, vector diffraction, radiometry, statistical optics, quantum theory, and image analysis. All of which cut across more disciplines than uh, were ever tried before. He attracted support from industry and government quickly um, and gained a reputation for giving real solutions to real problems. Most of the faculty members, maybe I'll talk about this later, but most of the faculty members he hired had gotten their PhDs, worked a few years in industry, and then came back to teach. So it was those few years in industry that gave them a, a perspective on how to get things done to cost, schedule, and performance, which is important when you're doing contract work. Uh, 1962, at the recommendation of his Air Force sponsor, Aiden started Consulting at Perkin Elmer, this is the story of Roland Shack. Dick Perkin, CEO at Perkin Elmer, was very impressed with both Aiden and Perkin Elmer new employee, young Roland Shack. Aiden convinced Dick Perkin to pay for Roland Shack to obtain a PhD in Imperial College, London. Oh, they what hell? Um, oh, probably. Um, <laughs> when Roland returned two years later, he worked briefly for Perkin Elmer, and then with the support from Dick Perkin, Aiden hired Roland, sorry about the two L's, to be the first optical sciences professor in early 1964. Um, funding, more faculty funding and facilities. The three F's. Noble. Uh, yeah. Noble L-E. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well. Thank you. <laughs> send, me, send me a memo. <laughs> no, I'll change it. Uh, Bob Noble, the P, he arrived and recruited Bill Wolf. I got Bill Wolf without the E. Uh, I had Bob Shannon. The 1965 catalog listed astronomy, optics classes by Minel, Noble, Shack, and Jacobs. Clarence Babcock joined the faculty. Jim Iyer, photo interpretation, joins the faculty. 1996, 1966, Bach moves to Tucson. On June 30th, Aiden resigns astronomy uh, and assumes directorship of the Optical Sciences Center. Phil Slaver came July of 66. Uh, Stavrudis came in 67. 68, Bartels was here. And 69 were uh, Arvind Marate and uh, Bill Wolf and Bob Shannon arrived. So I figured I'd just in that in that decade. Pardon? Roy Freeman. Oh, Roy Frieden. Uh, somebody taking notes? <laughs> somebody help me remember these. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just write that down for me. Thank you. Um, so I told you this was a work in progress. It's, it takes a lot of nerve to talk to the experts, all I do. Uh, early faculty was funded by the Science Development Program Grant. It was awarded to the university by the National Science Foundation in 1964. Arnold and Minel submitted a proposal to the Air Force for what became the Optical Sciences Center. And many new young faculty came from industry. And they wrote successful proposals to fund themselves, the graduate students and equipment. And the Air Force proposal uh, funded to support construction of the building and programs. Hardware. 
Uh, Aiden maintained a very active international travel schedule. He visited Hyderabad, India at least five times during, during this interval. Uh, they were building a 48-inch telescope. They had gotten funds, exchange funds on having something to do with food uh, to India program uh, to build a, an astronomical telescope an observatory. I don't know how somebody decided they needed a telescope. But um, he was there for that. He, they, he and Marjorie are pictured here at a radio telescope, of course. And I just got a very nice, maybe 10-page, double-sided um, email letter describing what he did in Hyderabad for that 48-inch telescope, written by the retired director of the department. So it's just like pay dirt. Uh, in China, he worked with them on mirror technology and the most uh, telescope development. And we have some pictures of him in China here soon. Um, now, he got a commendation that he didn't talk about. Um, and this is the, he being awarded the commendation on the left by the Secretary of the Air Force. And the person on the right is the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Lou Allen, who, when he retired from the Air Force, became director of JPL. And I've worked with him on a number of programs. And he, he told me, Jim, you know, I wouldn't have my career right now if it hadn't have been for Aiden Minnell. <laughs> Aiden Minnell's consulting, his technical advice, put me where I am now in my career. And he retired as the um, chief of staff of the Air Force and then became director of uh, JPO. Super guy. Super guy. Um, there. This is what the metal says. I'll read it. Dr. Aiden Lindell, while serving as scientific advisor to the Office of the Secretary of the Air Force on advanced space programs, distinguished himself by exceptional, exceptionally meritorious service to the United States Air Force, July 1963 to June 1966. His initiative, untiring devotion, inventiveness, professional acumen, exercise of judgment and resourcefulness in guiding the efforts of scientists and engineers have culminated in an important capability previously unobtainable. Motivated by patriotism, good citizenship, and a sense of public responsibility, Dr. Meinel has brought credit upon himself, rendered outstanding service to the United States Air Force, and made a significant contribution to the national security of the United States. Signed by Harold Brown, who was then Secretary of the Air Force. Now, this was 1966. Harold Brown went on to become president of Caltech, and then after that became secretary of defense under uh, Carter. So um, it would have been interesting to have seen um, Aiden Meinel's Rolodex to see uh, who, who, who was in it, you know, who we could just reach for the phone and call up and ask favors of. But he never did. Um, he would always ask for information but I've never known him to uh, ask for um, uh, favors that weren't earned. Um, solar energy. Well, this was interesting. So um, in 1973, Aiden Manel stepped down and turned optical sciences over to Peter Franken. Now, he and Marjorie had written a book. I should mention now. So Marjorie and um, Aiden are starting to publish papers together. Their family has grown. They're adults now. And Marjorie and Aiden always complained to me that while he was a director of something, or a leader of something, Marjorie could never work for him because of nepotism rules. So she could never actively collaborate with him when he was at the Stewart Observatory or building the Optical Sciences Center, because she was busy taking care of their children. Um, so now they're starting to publish papers and, and work together. They published a paper, a book, uh, Power for the People, in 1971 on solar energy. In October 1973, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries proclaimed an oil embargo. Do you remember, at least here in Tucson, even numbered license plates get gasoline on even numbered <coughs> calendar days. Um, so Arizona, Aiden and Marjorie started looking to the Arizona Sun. And um, together they wrote a book called Applied Solar Energy and Introduction which is a 400-page textbook uh, describing detailed engineering principles, um, concentrating mostly on solar thermal, 
although he does talk about solar photovoltaic. I should point out that this was the, absolutely the very first book on engineering, uh, of solar engineering for power, and was a textbook used in classrooms for about 10 years before it was, uh, was superseded. Most people here, I think, don't know that. Here's their work. Uh, that's a reflector they had up on the roof of this building. Um, no, that building. Um, if you go up to the eighth floor and look out, uh, you can just picture this sitting there um, on, the, uh, on the roof. Uh, it's a solar concentrator heating up uh, liquid that's moving through the uh, pipes. Now, Aiden, my nose, I mean, he'd, he'd gone to the catalogs and he'd looked up um, uh, heat capacity of, of various things. And he decided that uh, liquid sodium was the best thing to use. Now, if any of you have had a chemistry background, you know that liquid sodium is a heck of a thing to handle. It takes ceramic pipes, and uh, so everybody sort of laughed at him, you know. But you remember, you see, you know, that, that's impossible. You know, that's a, well, if you take Interstate 8 today, and you go out to San Diego, you find on your right about two miles of solar farms all run with liquid sodium. Solar energy today is a multi-billion dollar industry, all based on what Aiden did uh, in his textbook and in the, in the mid-70s. Now, this is a mystery to me. I come to you for help. Does anyone in this room know the context of this picture? It's a great picture of them, but what is it they're pointing at? And why? Um, can you help me, Steve? Do you know what that was? No. Nope. Don Lewis. Talk to Don. Oh, okay. Okay. That's a good idea. I'll talk to Don. He's on my schedule for next week. Uh, they're certainly pointing at something important. Thank you. So they did a lot to promote solar energy. Uh, they wrote, uh, they traveled the world giving papers at international conferences. Uh, Marjorie became a, uh, a temporary U.S. Ambassador to Energy Relations in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and um, they worked very hard for that. Aiden formed a company, did most of his work off campus here. Um, and Helios was the name of the company to work on solar energy. One of the things he did was to invent something called tumble logs, which were tumbleweed <laughs> crushed into a log. <coughs> he manufactured them for a while, and they discovered that actually the heat capacity of crushed tumble logs isn't very good. Uh, sawdust is far better. So they went out of that business. But he made optical filters for pointing mechanisms and power conversion technology. <coughs> for breaks and vacations, and they'd hike up into the, into the hills, and this is them together. Uh, it was a lifelong love affair. Oh, I do have some information. Having traveled with them, whenever we went to a hotel and we would check in, you know, you, you'd get most of the hotel rooms, at least in Europe and in Asia, they would have two beds in them. And the two beds were separated by about six feet. Well, the Minels insisted on a hotel room with the hotel staff push those two beds together. So they made one bed. And uh, if the hotel didn't do that, they went to another hotel. And this became a problem in China. It's, uh, it was overcome, of course. Um, so now Aiden came to, in 1982, uh, came to JPL uh, as a NASA Distinguished Science Visiting Scientist. Who should be the director that helped me hiring? But Lou Allen. So it was a pretty simple thing to do. Um, Aiden at, um, worked for me. At the time, he made 20% more than I did, which was fine. And he was worth every penny. Um, uh, a large deployable reflector, which eventually became James Webb Space Telescope, the Thousand Astronomical Unit Mission, uh, and Exoplanet Science and Technology. Uh, he did some work on the Hubble Prescription Retrieval and Repair, which we'll get to. And uh, we did some ground-based telescope concepts for China. Um, and um, great inspiration to younger engineers. Younger engineers would come in 
with problems, and uh, 30 minutes later, hour later, they walk out with solutions. So it was a tremendous asset. Um, slide says about the same thing. Oh, I on propulsion, the nuclear engines was one thing he seemed to be an expert on. I was surprised that he could carry his weight with any of the nuclear people at JPL and the ion propulsion lab. As a matter of fact, he spent some time down with the ion engineers talking to them about anodes and cathodes and how they could improve their propulsion system. Uh, so we had the Hubble. What did he do for the Hubble? Well, Hubble was launched the 24th of April 1990. In July 1991, the project announced an optical failure, and they set up two committees. Uh, the NASA Official Failure Review Board uh, was headed by Dr. Lou Allen. Uh, by the way, Dr. Lou Allen got his PhD in nuclear physics from Indiana. Uh, at the same time, he was a general officer in the Air Force. So he used the title general while he was an officer, of course. After he retired, he became doctor. Uh, anyway, the members of his review board were here, a number of them. Uh, it was me, and Bob Shannon, Roger Angel, and Bob Parks. The NASA Scientific Advisory Committee uh, was called HIORP for Hubble Independent, and I don't remember what ORP stands for, <laughs> uh, headed by Duncan Moore, and members of that included Aiden and Marjorie Minnell. So we had our bases covered. Um, whatever they did in the advisory committee, Aiden would come tell me and I would tell him what we did on the Planet Review Board. Uh, this is the Whitefield Planetary <coughs> Camera under construction at JPL. Uh, it's been the work it was the workhorse until it was replaced a few years ago. Um, this is the point spread function. Can you imagine that of the Hubble telescope? Now the Hubble telescope point spread function remains uncorrected. The correction is in the instruments. The telescope still delivers a blurred image. As a matter of fact, the, the caustic of the on-orbit Hubble Space Telescope is about 12 inches. That is, the distance between the uh, marginal focus and the fractional focus is physically 12 inches because of the, of the aberration. It's overcorrected. Uh, we managed eight contracts to determine the on-orbit optical prescription. Didn't need that many, but we had volunteers coming out of the woodwork. We recorded a bunch of images through focus and across the field of view and provided these images to teams for different analysis. Each one used a different method. Here's the Mindell's output. Um, they're down there at six and seven. So what we have is a table of the data source. <coughs> Uh, second column is the conic constant, value of the conic constant estimated on the mirror, and the other one is the wafer error. And those are all the people that, uh, that contributed to the effort, including Jim Feenup down there at the bottom, and some very fancy algorithms we used to reduce it. So this is a comparison of the measurements. thought you'd be interested in this. So on the vertical axis, let's see if I can see that. On the vertical axis, we have the um, Primary mirror conic constant, uh, 10 to the minus 3. On the horizontal axis, you have the wafer error. Um, and these are, you get 18 different measurements of the two. And the, um, uh, so the co-star was corrected here, and the white field was corrected up there. At that point, we use that prescription for that. But all of these are within, within the diffraction limit. The thing that really kills you on the, on the Hubble is the size of the actual magnetic patch is only about 200 pixels um, because of the wafer aberrations in the telescope. So you can't apply much image processing out into a field of view without local references. Um, so that's some more information on that. Let's see what next. There we go. Gee, I got even more. Well, there we are. So travel, travel, travel. Uh, Aiden and Marjorie seem to be always in the air. Uh, this is us in China on the left. And um, we went there to, to explore uh, glass, actually, a glass manufacturing uh, facility. So they asked us to give um, lectures. So, you know, communication with China is very hard. 
and this is 1986. So uh, what do you do? Well, I didn't know what they wanted to hear. They just wanted to hear general optics lectures from us. So I essentially emptied my filing cabinet of view foils. Back then we had these plastic transparencies. So I had this suitcase that weighed 100 pounds. It didn't really weigh 100 pounds. just felt like it. But that I took through uh, uh, with me. And when we got there, we found out that when they wanted us, when they said they wanted us to give a colloquium, they said in the letter they wanted a colloquium. What they really wanted us to do was lecture 10, 10 hours a day for four <laughs> days in a row. <clears throat> so fortunately, I had a lot of material with me. And uh, so Aiden would stand up and show my charts and talk for an hour. And he'd sit down and I'd stand up and go through some more charts and sit down. And we did that eight hours a day, eight to 10 hours a day for four days. And these are the people we lectured to. And the, the young man in the center is my son, Douglas, who um, we went on the spring break in the second semester of his freshman year at UC San Diego. So uh, it was a nice, uh, nice thing for him that I got him on our, on our visa. So he missed the first week of school because he had two weeks in China. But he made it up fine. So here we are touring. All of this, when you visit a foreign country like China, um, there's a lot of relationship development before you do business. And so this is all part of that relationship development. We're getting a tour of the areas around the Forbidden City. Uh, we took the back roads to a telescope in China. Uh, and I took a picture of Aiden and Marjorie in the back seat of this old, uh, old car. As you can see, Marjorie is cold. It, it was cold. I should say that we lectured, that we were there in March in uh, Nanjing lecturing. And in Nanjing, they, they turn, it's, it's March by the calendar, March 1st. So it must be summer. And they turn off all the heat in the buildings. Uh, so you, it's impossible. I see people laughing. So it's impossible to get any, uh, any heat. So what you do is you essentially put all the clothes you have in your suitcase on you in order to keep warm. And you, you circuit it in between you. Which, which pair of pants are on the outside and which pair of pants are on the inside. But you, you keep lecturing them, and um, it uh, was a lot of fun. Um, so we were there to inspect some glass manufacturing that was going on. They had a, a VO2 glass, zero coefficient of expansion glass material that uh, we were looking at to see how it competed with, uh, with Zero Dora. But I got a very nice tour of their um, glass manufacturing, Shanghai glass manufacturing plant. And it was exactly like the tour you'd have at shop in um, uh, Mainz, Germany. And they turned out uh, the equivalent of BK7 in large sheets. They turned out SF12. Um, all these glasses manufactured, except they had a Chinese name instead of the, uh, the shop name. And they were trying to sell us on buying some Chinese optical glass. <coughs> so we visited the an observatory, visited the radio observatory, and on the um, right here is Marjorie with the radio telescope. It took me a while to realize that this radio telescope was rather unique. It's not like our telescope. Because they didn't have have high quality transducer sensors. They actually had large waveguides that ran down from the focus of the telescope into an auxiliary room for the signal. So if you look very carefully on the, on the telescope, there's, there, there's a box of waveguide like this that goes down the outside of the telescope, straight down the pier and over into a building. And on the uh, right, you see some of the local residents. <laughs> so what did he do in retirement? Uh, he did the design and engineering of the Keck interferometer, optomechanical layout that we use today to combine the wavefronts of the two 10-meter Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Um, awards that he won, uh, the Optical Society of America Adolf Lowe Medal and the Frederick Ives Medal. I think, I'm sure at the time, and maybe even today, uh, he's the only person other than Edwin Land to have won both of these. Um, then he won the Helen Warner Prize of the Optical Society, an asteroid named after him. They won the gold medal of the SPIE, uh, Q 
King's Lake Medal. They won the King's Lake Medal twice. By the way, the King's Lake Medal, as you may know, is given for the most clearly authored paper. That is something that the text is very well written, been very well edited, good, good text. So they won it twice. Uh, won the SBA Goddard Award and the NASA Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. And in 1990, the uh, American Astronomical Society George Van Biesburg Award. So this is the end. I'm uh, not, not that far over, I guess. And um, send questions and comments to me as you uh, wish. Please do. Um, and make an appointment with me when I'm in town or when I'm in town next. And I'll do an oral interview with you. And I thank you very much. Good night. Thank you very much, Jim. Please.